a message beyond this medium and fiction enabling something. When we think about the sort of context in which we started Beirut in 2012, there is much to say. Um, but yes, we really start with uh, fiction enabling something. So, group dynamics demanded that I speak about Beirut as fiction. Closer? So, ah, pictures, yes, the such pictures. You can just open them up. No official start in the same order. Fiction for me. The black one is first. So I'm going to start with an assumption. Um, that assumption would be that as a piece of fiction, the institution also always wants to create realities. And it often does so by playing them. We've been talking a lot in the past days about art and politics. That's why I somewhere uh, play a little bit on the politics of friendship as well. But to give you another narrative entry point, given pedagogy is supposed to evolve in all of this, we could also say the following is sparked by an assignment by Louis Kaminsky. Write the biography of an idea. Since this is also very much about enacting improvisation, can you give it music? Yeah. Yeah. Since this is also very much about enacting improvisation, the following are just notes taken this morning about the beginning of the youth. Yesterday in a panel headed by the city of Shanghai, we learned about strong wind blowing through Beijing, and a very strong wind that comes in spring. To reverse the city logic, we will now think about Beirut being in Cairo. A city with very little wind, in fact, apart from spring perhaps, when the wind comes to visit the city, often in the company of a lot of sand. <laughs> Beirut was founded on 1st of May in spring 2012, and I remember the sand colonizing the streets of the mini dunes. At present, Beirut is three people, Sala, myself, and Antonia Lampi, who unfortunately couldn't be with us here today. In fact, she just landed in Paris airport, from where she sent us this beautiful picture, the next one, of an advertisement banner by the London-based multinational HSBC bank sharing the vision of the status of education in the near future. I was thinking that we could take that not so fictional, or perhaps not so fictional scenario as a backdrop for thinking about pedagogical models. And perhaps from the perspective of a financially strained not-for-profit institution, it also runs an imaginary school program to get inspired on how to draw new funds. If you can see it, it's a school chalk board with a $1 note. What is this? A pointer? Okay. I don't think I would be done. Beirut's Cairo Base closed just a little over a month ago, again on Labor Day, after three years on site programming. This coincidence, as I already mentioned, gives us a shared exit from a timeline both ways in and out with about the same duration in between. As it was more or less around the same moment when Yasmina and Philip started working on the research for their project, which we've just seen. And it was also Beirut's last program activity uh, to share some of their material and research locally before the project finally went on stage in Venice almost precisely a month ago as well, to coincide with the closure of our space in Peru. Like many other initiatives in Cairo, Beirut was without doubt born out of a necessity, but also very much born out of love. Sometimes love turns into work, which is something that is not to underestimate in the way it affects the politics of friendship too. But Beirut in Cairo did not close to due, due to financial reasons. It continues here, right here and elsewhere, because the love that sparked it in the first place is still there. In May 2012, the atmosphere in Cairo was still a breathing moment of possibilities. We felt the need to create something that expands our abilities of inhabiting the present. We're free to choose images. 
and then that contributes to articulating also collective desires so they can be shared, actually. And all of that was driven by a strong belief that art institutions can play an active part in organizing how political imagination takes place. So in the beginning, Beirut manifested a shared desire to create room for critical response, a place that collectively grows their response ability towards the shifts that we experienced in the cultural and civil society at that time. At that time, also many new art and cultural organizations were formed and conceived, and we could speak of a proliferation of alternative institutions, initiatives, and forms of organizing and self-organizing. A whole set of questions also ensued simultaneously with all of that, on how all of this would go down. How can we build or expand the public at that time? How can we engender collectivity within it? How can we learn from each other through considering forms of organizing as aesthetic practice, including organizing ourselves and others in the way we listen to each other? Let's assume that the function of institutions is to facilitate or amplify our capacity to act. But what do we do when we build and run institutions, in fact? What does it, the institution, do to everyone involved in its making, running, building, and breaking it down again? And how does that have any capacity to change anyone's social and political ability to act, participate in the changing and making of another future? These were just some of the questions we were grappling with a few years ago, and as I would say we still are. But the play field has changed, and it has changed continuously throughout these three years. Which is why our starting mission was to build an able institution in an unstable context. The ability to respond obviously requires flexibility in thinking and structuring our work and our program. So our intuitive response was to consider institution building a curatorial act. And from there, coming to the question, can we learn from an institution in the same way as we can learn from artworks? Can an institution learn from an artwork how to do this, in fact? So our point of departure was to assess the existing conditions for institutions of contemporary art and culture in Egypt. As a matter of fact, the Egyptian government grants no viable legal status for non-for-profit cultural institutions, yet it demands you to have one if you don't want to be criminalized. You're left with basically two options. One, to apply for the status of a non-governmental organization, or two, to register as an association. But none of the two is viable. Both make you vulnerable on different levels. As a consequence, most cultural institutions are hedged under the umbrella of one simple foundation, which has its base in Sweden, where it is registered under the name of some who lives in the suburbs of Stockholm. The prototype constellation of a shared precarity, I would say, safeguarded from the local wind by some sort of offshore oil. We started on the premise to make these conditions visible through our work and to reflect the steps we make and take to build an institution also from curatorial and artistic perspectives. The existence of an institution begins with its form and legal status. So we went back to the Swedish foundation model and this time commissioned Stockholm-based artist Duo Gold and Senevi to write an administrative guideline for our institutional becoming. As a result, we are now legally registered in Egypt as Golden Sandy Limited Liability Company since 2013, in legal, economic, and juridical terms. Beirut, on the other hand, does not exist. Beirut is just a name, a placeholder for more or less anything or any other place. It acts as a linguistic impediment upon the language we use to institute people, practices, among other things, including ourselves. The legal existence of Goldman Senebi LLC lives the same fiction and the same reality. However, it creates very different facts. The institution as artwork reaches a completely different audience, may that be funders, administrators, legal advisors, tax auditors, and eventually the eyes and ears of the Egyptian government. Before I always said Senebi mentioned it, hopefully, but I think this is something we should not hope for in the uh, For our audience, that comes to, to Beirut and our exhibitions and, and, and events, Golden Sanity LFC is more or less invisible. But for everyone else who is uh, involved with our legal or financial relationships, it is the only reference. 
As the actual name suggests, Beirut may not be where you located, but rather than saying it is some, someone else or someplace else, his name articulates no need to wear different hats. In that sense, Beirut is our working title, and if that, if, if Beirut was a play, you could think of it as a learning play. Within all this, Beirut is not a lie or a hoax, nor is it pure fiction. But I think it is safe to say that its strategies are less oriented towards the disappearance of the real than toward, towards the pragmatism, pragmatics of trust. Or, as Marcel Luther said about what drove him to become an artist, the idea of inventing something insincere finally crossed my mind, and I set to work at once. on three subjects, uh, where we speak to them, fiction, and action, and pedagogy. Uh, uh, and I feel like perhaps maybe it would be nice to, it would be nice to do uh, maybe one more sort of round where each of you actually sort of speaks a little bit to, to this particular question. Like, where does I and mean, the word workshop came up several times in different contexts, and maybe I want to know a little bit more. I and mean, we want to know a little bit more about um, yeah how how this factors in this idea of learning or pedagogy actually features in the making of a work or in the extension of the practice or in um, in the logic of an institution. Maybe we start again in the same order. With, uh, um, Um, and the extract that I tried to read at the very beginning before we started um, is, is actually a story written by a young journalist, his name is Mustafa Mohi, uh, and it's based on a series of history, memories, and oppositionary narratives related to, related to the 50s. I felt like what made more sense rather than just publishing what I'd already found is uh, developing workshops, um, uh, history workshops in different places in Egypt. So this one was in a remote island in Upper Egypt. Uh, with uh, young uh, people from the community uh, to re-explore the histories, uh, political histories and cultural histories of these particular areas. So, so this, the, the, the idea of the history, there are two main ideas of the history workshops. The first is making history accessible. So it's this question, like as Nina was saying, we don't have access to the archives in Egypt. We don't have access unless you're an academic, and sometimes as an academic, my, my love was, was as such, you, you don't get access anyway. Um, so we don't have access to historical narratives, whether because we don't have access to the sources or because the sort of military uh, uh, or nationalist narratives are very opaque. So the idea of the history workshops was to make history accessible through um, collecting archives. So I've been collecting archives from historians, Egyptian historians, as well as actually physically collecting archives from England about certain moments in Egyptian history. And we want to make them accessible online. But the second thing is historical literacy. So on every day in the workshop, uh, we, we spend every day looking at one, uh, one sort of form or source of history. So we spend one day looking at the archive, and we question the archive. So the archive is supposed to be the one sort of unquestionable source of history. It does not lie, supposedly. And we look at how the archive can be fiction. We look at the language used by the archive. We question who writes, we use Vishal of Trio, obviously. In terms we spend of every day looking at one, uh, one sort of form or source of history. So we spend one day looking at the archive. And we question the archive. So the archive is supposed to be the one sort of unquestionable source of history. It does not lie, supposedly. And we look at how the archive can be fiction. We look at the language used by the archive. We question who writes, we use Vishal of Trio, obviously. In terms of how the layers of silencing that exist in the archive. We look at oral history, and the, the, the participants spoke to the Nubian communities who were migrated during the building of the High Dam, the Aswan High Dam in 1964 in Upper Egypt. Uh, we look at newspapers, so we, t we take one incident of um, an uprising or, or, or a protest in 1952 in Egypt, where there, were, there was a Cairo fire, basically, it's known as the Cairo fire, and we look at how the same incident was re represented in the newspapers every 10 years. So we have the newspapers for 52, 62, 72, 82, and 92. We analyze the language used, who were the culprits,
Robert's War, the heroes, how did the fire happen, etc. Um, and uh, we look at uh, songs. So we basically look at all these different sources and we spend each day looking at the theories behind the politics of each source and how no source is a, a, a solid truth. And then we ask how we're going to retell these histories. And we look at uh, we, the, the participants divided into groups and do storytelling um, uh, and film. Um, and the idea behind this, again, is that we engage with history uh, as researchers, but also as people. As people who experience, re-experience the present through re-experiencing the past. And as people who are re-exploring how we can re-articulate um, uh, a certain moment in, in a different way. And so most of the stories that the participants wrote and, and retold in these different ways are also very emotive. Um, and I guess we can talk about that. Um, when we started with our film, we, we began with a workshop. Uh, neither Yasmin and I have a history, uh, a background in theater or in fiction film. Uh, so it was, uh, it was a workshop for us just as much as it was for the actors, really. We worked to begin with, um, with a theater director called Jacob Lindborg. Um, he's been living in Egypt for many years and he, he has, his practice is very much this kind of, a certain, a different kind of street theater. And um, he started with, with exercises that I think would be familiar to many of you that are partly inspired by um, Augusto Boal's kind of theater of the oppressed. Um, but a friend of ours, Lena Suleiman, told us um, quite early on that doing these kinds of exercises with Europeans compared to doing them with Egyptians is quite different because if you do it in your average kind of northern European city it'll take you a few weeks before you kind of get people to break the ice. When you're doing it in Cairo you're usually already working with, with actors. Um, people that don't need an icebreaker to start throwing a ball around or, or walking around in a circle or playing games. And this is really what the workshop was about in the beginning. It was actually allowing our actors to disconnect from life, from the kind of everyday uh, load of work and family responsibilities. And they, they tra most of them traveled um, an hour and a half to get to where we were doing the film. And I think just this trip, and then this the beginning of these um, playing these games really allowed for this process of imagination to start imagining um, something different. I mean, to start fabricating a world rather than being controlled or held down by the world that they live day by day uh, was made possible. And um, at some point, Yasmin and I continued without Jacob because we needed to be in the middle of that process, also learning and, and um, a, a more interactive process began with the workers. I mean, the first scene that you watched, if, if you were here for the film, um, is something that happened quite early on in the workshop. So this is where roles are kind of assigned to people, and there's one person who's lived this experience, and he, in the preparation period, he had time to tell other people how they're supposed to react and when they don't react the way that he remembers the officer having reacted to correct them and, and tell them how to do it. Um, but there was a certain switch that happened at a point in the workshop where we asked people to take on roles and just see what happens. And this was a moment where the workshop was kind of behind us, and the playing took on a life of its own. I just wanted to add that um, the, the scenes that you see, uh, they were not scripted, so it's very much based on improvisation. And, um, it, was, it was very surprising to, to, to all of us together in, in, during the workshop to see how these stories develop. Some of them completely fictive. Um, so there was a lot of role playing. Um, and what was very interesting to me was, uh, I mean, was this idea that role playing can, um, can become 
much more real from uh, from the documentary kind of experience that I had prior to the making of that film. And that is going to uh, a factory where there is a, a strike or an attempt to take over the, the workspace and the kind of interviews that the idea of interviewing people, of, of, of collecting testimonies, where of course there still is a, 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 a role playing uh, happening, a very different one. The one that is in front of the camera, the one that is representative of, uh, there's a lot of pushing uh, around the crowd, uh, trying to kind of, people trying to, 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 to be first, to speak first, to be representative of, uh, of what was happening, to take kind of leverage over, over each other. Um, and, um, and I think as an example of, 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 a, of a third kind of, kind of uh, role play that, uh, that, uh, that, that, that you see in the film is the mobile phone footage, which is done by a song who is a worker at the Starship and Lucas factory in the UN, and he, for uh, about a year, maybe a bit less, he was filming the, the demolition, the process of the demolition of his own factory. And it's, it's for those who, like, for most of you, uh, I imagine you, you read the translation, you read the subtitles of, of what it says, but the way it sounds uh, in Arabic, the language he uses is very, is much more formal and classical. Uh, I saw himself is, is a very shy man. It, it, we did try to interview him before. It was impossible to to have him speak to the camera or to us, in fact, even without the camera. Um, so this footage is very is very is very important because it's. It's not only an archive and a testimony, something that that that, that, that remains, but it's a, it's an attempt to uh, it's his own personal attempt in his own time, um, spent in the factory where nobody was watching, to uh, create evidence that can be used later on in in the media or perhaps in courts uh, against the owners. It was his kind of hope uh, that this 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 can can um, can work. 